and action. How are y'all doing? This week on Foolish Bailey, we'll be talking about how I grew the channel, Foolish Baseball. Now, last week I talked about how I started the channel, and there's a lot of personal information in there. There's a lot about, you know, where I was in my life at the time and the sort of decisions that led me to creating the YouTube channel, Foolish Baseball, in the first place. This video is going to be a lot more different. This video is less about the story and a lot more about the strategy. And so if you are looking to grow any sort of creative project, I'm going to offer whatever advice I can. So that's what this video is for. Now the fact of the matter is that when I left off in the story, I just dropped the Justin Verlander video and I was up to 6,000 subscribers on YouTube. So the truth is, a lot of difficult growth had already occurred, so I can't just ignore that. Because the fact of the matter is that starting at zero is the absolute hardest thing about growing on the internet. That zero to 100 subscribers, that zero to 1,000 subscribers, that is the hardest thing you're gonna do. Going from zero to 100, whether it's followers, readers, viewers, whatever it is, that's the hardest 100 you'll get. And then the next 100 comes a little bit easier. And the next 100 comes a little bit easier. And then suddenly you're at 1,000. Growing from zero to 1,000 is just as hard as growing from 1,000 to 1 million if you believe that the growth is exponential. And I believe that the growth on the internet where it's driven by algorithms is exponential. So how did I start from zero? Because I do believe in the growth stage, that is the hardest part. And for me, it was about creating something that didn't exist, but people wanted, and then I had to find those people. For me, that was videos about out of the park baseball, and the people that wanted them were on the subreddit asking questions about how to play out of the park baseball. So it remains true that if you're creating something that no one else is making, you have no competition. Look, if you want to start a YouTube channel from scratch where you play Minecraft, if someone goes on YouTube searching for Minecraft, they will never find you. You have to get more specific than that. Maybe you make videos about a specific Minecraft mod that isn't popular, but could be someday. So I did my 0 to 800 subscribers through OOTP, and then from 800 to 150,000 subscribers through Baseball Bits. Now, when I started making baseball bits, there weren't very many people making videos that covered Major League Baseball. There were plenty of guys playing MLB The Show, but actually not that many talking about things going on in the league or the history of baseball. And for me, getting more specific and doing something unique, the channels that were talking about baseball, they weren't speaking my language. They didn't talk about spin rate. They didn't talk about advanced defensive metrics. They didn't talk about OPS+. Plus. If they talked about war, they didn't fully understand it. This is a problem that I would describe as the disconnect. And the disconnect is way stronger in mainstream baseball media, like what you see on TV, on ESPN, or whoever's in the broadcast booth, or MLB Network. Teams are ran on sabermetric principles. The front offices don't care about batting average, they certainly don't care about pitcher wins, and they certainly don't care about runs batted in. Moneyball was 20 years ago, and the principles running the game have fundamentally changed. These aren't even a shiny brand new thing anymore. We're far beyond it, and yet the disconnect persists. The disconnect occurs when you have people whether that's in the broadcast booth, whether that's in the studio, or even their bedroom, discussing things like strategy, transactions, roster construction, etc., without understanding the principles that guide ball clubs today. I'm not saying that these people are wrong for caring about runs batted in, but I'm saying that the teams that they talk about don't care. That's the disconnect. And so what I wanted to do with Baseball Bits was bridge the gap. I would read about baseball on fan graphs and baseball prospectus, but that perspective didn't exist on YouTube. Again, this is like the bare minimum of how ball clubs are run. A lot of them are so far beyond anything I could describe. There are plenty of front office types who started their careers at fan graphs and baseball prospectus, so you don't really have to like it, but I wanted people to understand it. And I wanted them to see that the newer numbers running the game could be fun and not soul-sucking. Again, I don't think there was anyone on YouTube consistently doing that when I started. There's more now, but I think some of that is due to the success of Baseball Bits. For me, statistically, when the Justin Verlander video blew up, I just stopped doing everything else. I, I never made OOTP again, I never made Arm Punt 2. I had hit on a format, and I was just going to keep doing it. And it helped that I really enjoyed making the videos, but that positive feedback drove me to make more on a consistent basis. 
I think it's cool to acknowledge that in terms of my growth personally through Foolish Baseball, I don't really fit the mold, you know, like I'm on YouTube and I make about 16 to 18 episodes of Baseball Bits per year, and that's it. That's pretty different from how many approach YouTube. The YouTube game has a lot of volume shooters that upload two to three times a week or even daily, and their growth is different from mine. It's a little bit more steady, and my growth is really based around, hey, How's the most recent baseball bits doing? You know, I get about 16 or 18 attempts to go viral while other channels get hundreds, but the flip side is that my videos are better, simply because I'm willing to invest weeks of time into them. Look, this is kind of a weird way of describing it, but to go viral, you gotta penetrate the layers. Let me show you what I mean. All right, what I've got up here are what I would call sort of my personal layers. These are the layers that I'm attempting to penetrate. So this is really explaining, you know, who sees a video when I drop it. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get as far out as possible to reach the most people. So this is really just describing what is a video's audience. And I think for everyone sort of in an online content creation world, we should all be asking ourselves, what do our layers look like and who are we trying to reach and how far do we have to go to reach them? So for me, the most interior layer is the rider dies. And those are the people you're going to be reaching no matter what. No matter what, you're going to get to this purple circle. Um, so, you know, if I make a video and only the rider dies see it, it would look like this. Now, the rider dies are the people who are going to watch or view or read anything that you do. Those are the rider dies. Outside of the rider dies, I have the subscribers. These are the people, you know, who, who follow you. Um, but they might not watch every single thing you do, and that's fine, but that, that's sort of the next circle. What you're going to try to be doing is getting to some of these more exterior, cir ex sorry, exterior circles if you want to grow. Because if you only make content for your ride or dies, or you only make content for your subscribers, you're going to find that you never actually grow, right? You're already making content for an audience that's there. You need to also be making content for an audience that isn't there. Um, so, you know, if I make a video, I'm hoping to go past all that. I'm hoping to get past even the frequent viewers who aren't subscribed, and maybe now I'm accessing baseball fans, all right? I've already pushed through like three layers here just to get to baseball fans, and this is really where I'm going to grow. If I can get videos to baseball fans who aren't frequent viewers, subscribers, or ride or dies, that's what I want to do. And if I want to really go viral, I can hit here, and if I just, you know, maybe every now and then, maybe every now and then I can actually get to here with like a video about the Astros cheating or something like that. That's that's sort of the goal is to get to the general population. You don't have to do that every time, but if you can do that, you will grow a lot. So let's say you were a volume shooter, right? So you were someone who was doing a project and sharing it, you know, two or three times a week or every day. The problem you might encounter is that you're only making content for the ride or dies. They're going to see it. However, you're not actually growing. So for me personally, with my 16 to 18 videos a year, I have a much better chance, you know, per shot of reaching the baseball fans or of reaching the sports fans or of reaching the general population, you know, like like the, the volume approaches like lottery tickets, you know, for me, it's more like a 10% chance every time. So that's kind of the difference of strategy. But yeah, that, that's what I'm talking about. You need to ask yourself, how far do I need to go before I'm actually growing? A big question I think any of us trying to make it in a creative field should ask, are we ready? Like, are we ready for people who don't like us, for people who don't know our stories, to see what we've made? If I show something I made to my mom, she'll always like it. She's on my side. If I show that thing to 10,000 strangers who have no reason to be nice to me, the reactions might be different. So I think if you're making something, ask yourself, are my skills at a point where I'm ready for a lot of people to see this? Is it up to the standards of what a general YouTube audience, Twitter audience, poetry audience, comedy audience, theater audience, movie audience, photography audience would expect? Because here's the thing, you might be small, but we spend most of our time watching big things from experienced people. People are getting my videos recommended in the same sidebar they're getting recommendations from Jimmy Fallon and Mr. Beast. If I want to compete with those guys, I gotta come correct. This is kind of the reality check because we spend so much time hoping and wishing that our big break might come, but are we ready for it? I know I wasn't quite ready, but I was close enough, you know. Foolish Baseball isn't just a thing I did for a year before it took off. 
It's a result of a lifetime of baseball fandom and learning how to edit videos starting when I was like 13 years old. So what you see when I make a baseball bits is the result of a lot of practice. And if you need to make a hundred videos before you're any good at it, my advice is to make a hundred videos. If you need to write a hundred articles before you write a good one, go ahead. I didn't think baseball bits would be my job when I started. The first one got 80 views, but I simply kept going because I enjoyed doing it. So that was some general creative advice. Now I'm gonna launch into some practical YouTube advice. So for the people watching this, that specifically wanna grow on YouTube, this is for you. YouTube is driven by the algorithm, and that makes it different from other pursuits, like say, starting a small business. In my world, growing a YouTube channel isn't about me trying to market, because the algorithm already does that. Foolish Baseball had 200 million impressions in 2020. That's 200 million instances in which someone was given the opportunity to click on a video I made. If I was able to tell a hundred people I met in real life about the channel, that would be absolutely meaningless compared to the power of the algorithm. Now, YouTubers hate the algorithm when it's not on their side, but it made me. It made all of us. I would still be at 800 subscribers if the algorithm hadn't permitted me to grow. So if the algorithm is what's permitting us to grow, the question becomes, how do we ask for permission? You know, if you're sitting here with good videos and you're ready to penetrate the layers, you should only worry about two things and ignore almost all other feedback. The first thing you gotta worry about is click-through rate. Click-through rate is the rate at which people click your video when presented with the option. And there's no solid answer to what's a good click-through rate. When I post my videos, they get a click-through rate of about 20% for the first hour, but of course in that first hour, I'm only reaching my ride or dies. Once I get to the point of reaching general baseball fans, it might fall to 3%. If you're on a super small channel, you might have a really high click-through rate, but that's because you're only reaching the ride or dies, and YouTube isn't feeding your video impressions. So how do you get a good click-through rate? It's all about title and thumbnail. That's it. Worry about your title and thumbnail. You know, if I have a list of topics for baseball bits, I will often just pick the one that I think will have the best title and thumbnail combination. The second and final thing you gotta worry about is audience retention. That's how long people stay on your video after clicking. Again, as I penetrate the layers, it's gonna fall, but I want it to be as high as possible. You know, in my ideal world, everyone who clicks on the video finishes it. But that means, of course, you can't do pure clickbait, you know. You have to deliver on the promises of the title and the thumbnail. Because if not, people will realize you're a phony and leave early, which is absolutely poisonous for the algorithm. So while click-through rate and audience retention might be the only two things you need to worry about, what they represent is making an engaging video with an engaging title and an engaging thumbnail. That's the name of the game. Do that. For me, it means taking my time, and I'm telling you, you can make that work. You just have to make really good videos. If you can make a really good video in a day, go ahead. Me, I need two or three weeks. You know, I'm not that great. Others might need months or even years to make a really good video. But listen to what the algorithm is telling you. That's what's going to determine growth on YouTube. And if you don't like it, find a new website. So that's the strategy I've used to grow from 6,000 to 150,000 subscribers in two years, and I did it by making weird videos about baseball stats that look like video games, you know? I did it by honing my skills, I did it by creating something unique and listening to the algorithm. That's my story of growth. A lot of this is luck, but there are things we can do to manipulate luck. That's what this video is about. It's about creating our own luck. So there it is. That's how I grew Foolish Baseball. Now, next week should be a fun one because I'll be answering some of the most common questions I get about the channel, specifically how I use video from MLB, how I make a living, and so on and so forth. Stay tuned.